Her representation of House Calanderall in purchases would keep them discreet from both public notice and royal court scrutiny. Hail and well met and welcome back to another Realms Lore video. I am here with the original creator of the Forgotten Realms himself, Sarah Ed Greenwood. And today we are talking about some property barons of Cormier, and uh, I'm going to let you fill in some of the details. Sure. By the time we get to the end of this year's videos, if you want to run a campaign in Sembia, you're going to be set. Sembia is right now in the 1490s DR, and right now this video is about one Sembian noble family that's trying to buy up the Cormier. If you're enjoying these Realms Lore videos, please be sure to check out patreon.com slash edgreenwood. If you become a protector of the realms there, you're going to actually be supporting our ability to continue creating videos for you here. So, uh, yeah, please enjoy this Realms Lore video on one particular noble house of Sembia. A Sembian noble house reaches out, trying to buy up Cormier in 1499 DR. One Sembian noble house is starting to become known outside Sembia in some circles because of what they seem to be trying to do with their wealth. Buy up as much of Cormier as they can. Meet House Calandral. Patriarch of the family Ilmarin Calandral was shaken by the Thultanthan occupation. For the first time in his personal worldview, unassailable Sembia was suddenly just one very fragile egg in the family basket, and he resolved there should, and soon would, be others. Like most Sembians, he thought of Cormirians as an overly ruled people who were kept down from freedom, financial success, and happy lives by their tyrant royalty backed by ever-present soldiers and the kingdom's lying-spying war wizards in particular but there was no denying the relative safety such militaristic institutions had brought to that land, even in the face of strong Thultanthan mercenary armies. So, if looking beyond Sembia for places to invest, Cormier right next door was the obvious first answer. Ilmarant was old school in that he mistrusts the laws and trading customs of any country not Sembia, and unlike the Dales, where his wealth will, he thinks, allow him to bully locals, that means investment in Cormier, with its strong laws and enforcement, really means buying real estate that can be rented out to others, becoming a landlord, rather than chancing Calanderall funds on businesses run by Cormierians who might well prevail in a court if some dispute arose. And in Ilmarad's thinking disputes always arise in business. It's mere common sense that urban real estate is more valuable than countryside property, though the fringes of a large settlement, the fields immediately around a walled city, for example, are also desirable. In the case of Cormier, the capital Suzeo is the prize, whereas Marsember has always had a shady and waterlogged reputation and Arabelle is a rebellious frontier center closest to threats from Zentarim armies. So, invest in tall houses and shops in Suzeo. Being as warehouses therein are relatively few and coveted by many, so bargain prices are not to be had. Having resolved thus, Ilmarin gathered two of his sons and one of his daughters, leaving the child he judged most capable, his eldest daughter, Varara, in charge, running Calandral affairs from the sprawling, many-turreted stone family mansion of Wave Wind Towers in Selgaunt, his wife, Avorna, having regrettably perished in childbirth more than a decade back, and no suitable replacement having yet struck his eye, and went on a sightseeing tour of the neighboring forest kingdom. Which was, of course, really deciding on where in Suzale to buy properties and learn the lie of the land across the rest of the land of the Purple Dragon to see if other places might be suitable or even preferable. Ilmarant considers his younger daughter, Corvara, far shrewder and more disciplined than either of his sons, though they are both senior to her in years. So he cozened his sons by speaking of their 
boldness, good looks, and superb horsemanship into go-and-see-and-report-back forays, and took counsel of the places they deemed possible with Corvara, by in visiting them with her white, well, his elder son, Kiladar, and his younger son, Nermerales, rode off on other forays. It was Corvara who got a young Cormirian noblewoman, Alacastra Emerask, tipsy, in the Sapphire Shadow Club in Suzale, West Front Court Close, eight doors south of the promenade, and wormed from her the name of a trustworthy factor trading agent resident in the city, Windrose Halarkos of Garth Street, a bespectacled, plain-looking, bookish brunette of middling years and height, an increasingly plump build, a scribe and clerk of purse hardened by trading swindles into iron-hard determination and a crisp, see-to-all-details manner. Her representation of House Calanderol and purchases would keep them discreet from both public notice and royal court scrutiny. Windra was forthwith engaged, and Ilmarant found her delightfully honest, open, and affordable. She commanded a fee of only 120 gold pieces per purchase, regardless of the price, and from it she paid the registry transfer fee. Through her, House Calandral was soon the owner of ten and six tall houses scattered across western Suzale, half of them in the name of Ilmarant's new personal holding company, True Cormier Holdings, and a farm about half a mile east of Eastgate along the Dragon Eye Way, with Windra looking for more. Satisfied that he could trust Windra so long as the claims in her fast gallop letters were borne out by what he could see via the far scrying spells cast by a hired mage, one Belayard Crowsroost, a war wizard retired to Suzale as his white bearded years gave way to his hairless after years, Ilmarant retired to Selgaunt and began empire building. Or at least buying up Cormir as if there was nothing else worth purchasing in all the world, scores and then hundreds of properties. Timora smiled upon him during a tricky period of cash flow problems, but once past that, he'd steered House Calandral into a golden valley of rents, a metaphorical territory wherein even if two in ten tenants were late in paying or failed to pay at all, and eviction would be necessary, providing Ilmarant and his kin with a monthly income handsome enough to continue property buys without hesitation or weighing prices. Sitting tenants remit rents to a professional paymaster, collector, a uh, Relvard Lamorant of Weymoot, who is hired by Windra and is considered one of the better drain purses in his unloved profession. So, the money rolls in. Not that Ilmarant has yet begun buying the last two gaps in a street front run or other strategic buying, as he sees that as a certain way to get investigated by Cormir, and he detests the thought of being mind-dreamed by those villainous war wizards almost as much as he dislikes the thought of clerks of the royal court in Suzale hampering every subsequent purchase and adding fees at every breath as they loot and foul the necessary ledgers and records. However, unbeknownst to him, his purchases were noticed by the royal court and the war wizards the moment he bought his third Suzalean property, and he was investigated by two high knights, Shiresra <laughs> Daha and Kragor <laughs> Hawkmantle, in quite separate investigations. Daha operates more in Sembia than at home in Cormir, posing as a merchant speculator, backing one bold new venture after another and needing backers to help her meager funds for each one, and secretly bankrolled by the dragon throne, she shall never be reduced to begging. Using these risky activities as a pretext for crisscrossing Sembia constantly, she sees much and reports it to certain trusted former Queen Philferal's blades, half-elven woman who still serve the crown of Cormir, and in doing so often travel, acting as escorts for clergy, 
uh, from the Dragon Reach Shore Dales to Cormier and back again. Daha encounters them by chance while overnighting in roadside inns. Hawk Mantle is a point high knight, as in sword point, meaning he's often used in situations where assassinations or running fights may be likely, and spends a lot of time posing as a smuggler operating out of Marsember and into Sembian ports, Tazir and Westgate. Both of these Eyes of the Crown could find no sinister intent on the part of Ilmara and Calandral, and when Daha nudged a Noan Bleth supporter into hinting to the Calandral Patriarch that he might be welcome in an effort to change the warmer of the Dragon Throne, Ilmara firmly replied that he avoided politics and wanted no part of anything that might imperil the current prosperity of Cormir, or anywhere else for that matter. So, Ilmarant remains under scrutiny, but not under suspicion, and nothing has been done to hamper his purchases thus far. His children are back in Sembia, and seemingly happy to be so, though Cormir's eyes have noticed that Corvara took a liking to Suzale and has visited it twice since, reveling with the bright young laughing set of nobles and wealthy wannabe nobles, but not taking up with any males. Though the spies reported that she did, quote, survey the fine meat on offer, unquote. Ilmarant is on the verge of his 70th year and remains as hale as ever. Though his raven black hair is dyed and he no longer rides fine stallions for leisure. Certain local ladies of higher pleasure visit him regularly, but he no longer goes to them, nor seeks others. House Calandral will be headed by his eldest child upon his passing, and that is the formidable and capable Morara, who has seen 42 winters of life in Suzale and learned much from each of them. Kildar is a year her junior and detests her and her domineering and being a bellicose, large, strong man of good looks, hot temper, and strong will, may even try to seize power or as much as he can of family holdings. His two summers younger brother, Namel, Namoreres, is a smiling, please all, smooth tongued diplomat of weak will. The youngest at 37 summers, Calandro, Corvara, has the charm and stunning good looks that Morara can't quite match and the two like each other not. But Corvara has the wits and drive to build her own life in Cormir if she leaves Houth Calandral behind. It's rumored she has the gift, but keeps this hidden, receiving tutelage and simple arcane spells during her frequent trips to Deepingdale to see the wizard Palavar of High Moon. Selgant Gossip hisses correctly that she's having an affair with him without ever hitting upon the truth that she's paying for her tutoring with her body and both she and Palavar are content with this and are good friends with no yearning on either side of establishing any sort of hold over the other. The road ahead for the house of the ruby cockatrice for that is the calendral badge a rampant regardant crimson cockatrice on a white field bordered with gold is as hidden as it is for all others, but they are on, are on firmer financial ground than many. Even if their house stands in peril of shattering apart when Ilmarant breathes his last. And like nigh all nobles of Sembia, House Calandral has its foes, the houses of Ithavis, Sorgil, and Yontil, and its rivals, the houses of Akanar, Malvin, and Zondil. Elminster is of the opinion that whatever befalls Calandral, Corvara will remain standing strong. And there you have a look at one Sembian noble family, House Calandral.